Tonight we are continuing in the fourth chapter of Ephesians. This will be our 52nd lesson. <coughs> we are now in the section of uh, this fourth chapter where he's going to build on what he said in the particularly verses 12 through 16. <coughs> and you'll pick up there's a certain spiritual tone in this text that unveils a seriousness of failing to grow up into Christ. That's the point that he's targeting. He's already told us that the objective God has for the church is not just that it'll be here. It's not just to get people into it. It is rather that they'll grow up into Christ so that Christ can more the more fully express himself to the people. Amen. Now as noble as it sounds, as naive as it sounds, that Christ can work through anybody, that's not altogether true. That's why it was so important in the third chapter that Paul said he's praying that God would strengthen them with might by his spirit in the inner man so Christ could dwell in their heart by faith. <laughs> so as ideal as it may sound that God can speak through anybody and God can work through anybody, it's, that's just a lit, that's too simple for God's people to think on that level. Amen. And I can understand a beginner thinking like that, but people that are grown in Christ should not think like that. That's not the way it is. If it is... Exactly what is the point to the admonishment of admonishment to grow? Yeah. What exactly is the purpose of that? If this isn't true that this curtails divine activity when people do not grow. Mm -hmm. They throttle what God's doing. Now the church has from the very beginning had a lot of difficulty with this matter of growing. Even in the apostolic day, the Roman church was admonished, for instance, to capitalize on renewing the mind. That has to do with growth. The Corinthian church had difficulty and were, in this matter of understanding. We're told to stop being children and understand. Just stop it and be men in understanding. And the Galatians, they'd been subverted by false teachings, so they didn't even think like the Lord did at all anymore. Colossians were on the verge of being led astray by philosophers and by Jewish teachers. Their understanding was being corrupted. And Paul had to write about this. It was a serious, serious matter. The Philippians even had some among them that didn't realize how important it was to abandon all competing pursuits and press toward the mark. He said, this is what I do and this is what you should do. But if we know that there's some people otherwise minded. They just they weren't there yet. Hadn't seen it yet. That was a good church. The Thessalonians had some people, they were confused about the coming of the Lord. You, you can't be confused. There's some things you can't be confused about. You just can't. That's all there is to it. If you don't understand it, you've got to make it your aim to get understanding on these things. Not to dawdle around about it. You, don't have, you may not have time. The Hebrew believers... They, they had failed to see the absolute centrality of Christ, even though they once knew it. They'd been in a backward, backward stance. And there were seven churches that Jesus addressed in Asia, and five of them, had, he said he had something against them. The, the head of the church had something against the church. Now, don't tell me that's an enviable position. That's the Savior we're talking about. He's not only a Savior, he's the Lord. Yes, amen. He's the head of the church. And Jude, he wanted to write about the common salvation to the saints. He couldn't do it. He had, to, he had to devote his attention to them, earnestly contending for the faith they'd gotten sloppy in the way they were living. This was in the first century. Yeah, yeah. He's plumb out of hand now. Yeah. Some churches take these books of correction 
James is another one, and they think these are the ideal books. They do. You see, they're books of correction. Well, of course, if a person needs the correction, that is, they are right. They ought to use their book. <coughs> now, all of these situations have been revealed in the scriptures about the different churches, how the apostle addressed them. They revealed a failure of the churches to grow up into Christ. <coughs> it was a great concern to the apostles, particularly Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles. It was particularly important. He told Ephesians and Colossians, he went, kind of went to the length telling how he prayed for them that they'd grow up, mature in Christ. To me, this is the most difficult and alarming situation that we have in the church of our day is it is not an understanding church. I mean, it isn't. That's just, a person can beat around the bush and try and be nice about it, but this thing has gone on too long and it's getting worse. If Paul were here, he'd be writing a lot of letters, I'll tell you right now. Of course, the trouble he'd, read it, he'd run into is they wouldn't be read today. Yeah, that's right. Paul were to write an average letter to church today, they wouldn't even read it. The leader read it, he wouldn't read it to the people. Why? Because understanding is that low. It's at that low of a level. Spiritual Babylon, they've confused the state further. They've made spiritual ignorance standard. And they've made spiritual understanding, you're like the elite. That's how they've turned things upside down. See, not only are spiritual, as we're going to see in our text tonight, not only are spiritual children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, and oh, think of the winds of doctrine <laughs> that are existent today. You can't get away from it. There's wind blasts of false doctrine going on all around us, and it's increasing. Some of us are hearing things we never dreamed we'd hear. In the name of Christ, they're being said. So, but that's not the only thing that's uh, dangerous about being a child. Those who are made in childhood are actually drifting back to the state out of which they were delivered. Yes. And that's, that's what we're going to touch on tonight. Verses <coughs> 17 through 19. <coughs> This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth, in henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who past feeling, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now, why did he talk like that to this church? This church was noted for his faith in Christ and his love for the brethren. So it wasn't like in a severe backslidden state. But it wasn't as understanding as it should have been. That's why Paul prayed the eyes of their understanding to be enlightened. That's why he prayed that. Because he knew the result of not growing is disastrous. Amen. Do you know there are some people that, I, I know this is the case, I've known some of them. There are some people that haven't really had a spiritual epoch occur in their life for decades. There's not been a new burst of understanding. It, just, it, it hasn't happened. Those to whom it has happened, know the effect of it already upon the soul. Well, let's look at this text. <clears throat> this I say, therefore. Some other versions say, the NIV says, so I tell you this. So, so I tell you this. The New, Amer New Revised Standard Version said, now that I have said these other things. Now, this I affirm. 
the uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible says, Therefore, in view of what I've said, I say this. New American Bible says, So, in view of what I just said, So, I say, that I tell you, that, so I declare. The Living Bible says, Therefore, I warn you. The Williams Bible says, So, I mean this. In other words, he's drawing a conclusion. Philip's Bible says, Philip's letters to the church says, this is my instruction then. It's the message Bible, and so I insist. So this is uh, thought building language. It's not enough just to say the truth. You've got to draw some conclu valid conclusions. It's the conclusions that make the difference. It's what you draw from the truth that makes the difference. So Paul's going to draw some truth. Now the conclusions have been revealed to the apostles and prophets. It doesn't mean you can't draw conclusions, but you can't draw them at the level the apostles and prophets could draw them. There's some people could read Ephesians 4 from now to Jesus comes and they'd never have this conclusion. They'd never arrive at this conclusion. They get going and determine they're going to read Ephesians 4, 12 through 16 once every day for two or three years and they still not arrive at this conclusion. God doesn't leave that for men just to arrive at that conclusion. He's going to conclude it for them. See, there's a process in motion in these ministries. Apostles, foundation layers, prophets, people with insight that can put it together, <coughs> evangelists, people that can bring the gospel to bear on whatever is being said, pastor teachers who care for the flock of God and feed them. And they set in motion certain processes that are going to take place, guarantee the people of God are <coughs> not tossed to and fro. That's the aim. Everyone that stands before the people of God, make, this has to be their aim. I aim for, to make a contribution so they'll not be children tossed to and fro because you're not the only person that has their ear. The sooner people learn this, the better it's going to be. They're hearing a lot of other people, whether on purpose or accidentally or inadvertently, there's other people that have their ear. And the only way they'll be able to sort things out is they got to grow up. If they don't grow up, they'll be con now not just be confused, they'll be tossed like a ball. There's some people can take whole congregations up and throw them like a ball off kilter. Just by sheer speech and manipulative thinking, they can take an entire congregation and divert them from Christ in one sermon. You don't think that's true? There's men that have done this. Why do you think some of these nutcases have become famous? Why do you think that's happened? Because they're preaching to children. That's why. They are preaching to men they'd have been ousted a long time ago. <coughs> the ultimate outcome of the whole thing is the body must edify itself in love. Now that's stated in 415. It's stated. That's a revelation. Amen. Under the edifying of itself in love. That's the aim. That the body can be like self-contained and can edify and contribute in love to one another. That's, that's where it's got to end up now. <coughs> so Paul, he draws some conclusions. Now here we're facing a particular weakness in our day, drawing valid conclusions. Oh, <laughs> this, <laughs> this, you could never start a theological school on this subject. There's some people who have never drawn a conclusion. They've just read what conclusion somebody else said. It's what kind of conclusions you draw that reveals where you're at. Yeah. 
For instance, <coughs> some people heard Paul teach about grace, that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So they concluded, let's do evil that good may abound. Yeah, yeah. was their conclusion. Some people teach you ought to be in a state of repentance all the time. Yeah, yeah. That's the same thing as saying we ought to sin that we may abound. That's yeah. a, it's just a fancy way of saying it. Yeah. But it's the same thing. We all sin all the time, but God not understands. God forgives us. God, Is that so? Is that the kind of Savior you think Jesus is? He says, go and sin no more. Amen. That's what Jesus says. He's not, he's not even that kind of Savior, see. I understand that if a person stumbles, there's grace for it. I understand that. But Jesus said, if you start walking in the light, you'll quit stumbling. Yeah, that's, right. that's what he said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Others, <coughs> they read in the Bible, saved by grace. Through faith, he's able to keep from falling. He that believes in me shall never perish. And they conclude, when once you're saved, there's no danger anymore that you'll be ousted. That's their conclusion. Is it a right conclusion? No, it's not a right conclusion. Should we be bashful about saying it? No. The dangerous conclusion. Yes. But one of the reasons that this sort of thing exists is because of how the truth has been segmented in, in the thoughts of men. The, the righteousness of God is not even in the thoughts of someone who can entertain the notion that a person can be saved and secure and no longer in danger until you're in a, a secure position of not failing of the righteousness of God, then you're in a state of, of yeah. possible jeopardy. Mm -hmm. God is not going to receive sin or or defilement in any form. Mm -hmm. Now, he's not going to do it. Yeah. And if you're doing anything that's defiling, then it has the potential of separating you from God. Yeah. If it's not repented of and turned from. Mm -hmm. And you have to abide in grace. This is... All of this, this inner connection of truth, it's, it's kind of like washed away and people focus in on a particular aspect. They want to argue about, can you lose your salvation without any reference at all to a righteous God? Yeah. Amen. We're talking about the love of God without, without any reference at all to the purpose of God in salvation or the death of Christ and the life of Christ. There's just... There's just too much ignorance that's applied to yeah. these areas. Uh -huh. See, here's the, mm -hmm. this is the thing that is overlooked both by the people who teach this doctrine and the people who practice it. See, I come from a group where they practice it, but they didn't teach it. Uh -huh. Is that whatever you have, you have by faith. Yeah, right. And you are no more safe than your faith. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Your degree of safety is determined by how much faith you have. And that's the part that's overlooked. You have it by faith. Yes. You're not home yet. You're not there yet. You have it by faith. And these ministries are designed to strengthen the faith. Build them up in the most holy faith. <coughs> Scripture said. Now Paul says, I testify in the Lord. Some other versions said, I, I affirm together with the Lord. It's a new American standard. I insist on it in the Lord. That's the NIV. I give witness in the Lord. It's the basic Bible English. I attest to you in the Lord. It's the New Jerusalem Bible. I'm speaking for the Lord. Living Bible. And as in his presence, the Amplified Bible. Well, all of that is to say that his mind is in sync with the mind of the Lord. What he's saying is what Jesus has to say on this subject. Amen. It's like saying, I have the mind of Christ. Yeah. That's yeah. what he's saying. So what I'm saying, this is not like an opinion of mine. This is not like an idea I garnered after I thought on these things. I come up with this idea. This is the way Jesus thinks what I'm going to say. I'm testifying in the Lord. <laughs> Now, from henceforth, he says, 
that ye, hence ye, plural, remember he's talking to the church, all of it, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. <laughs> henceforth, generally speaking, is from the time you came into Christ from that point. The standpoint of our text is from right now. From henceforth. Whatever has happened up to this point, henceforth is, what, is what's to happen from now on. Amen. Henceforth. In other words, you can't come into association with Christ without a change taking place. Amen. Amen. That's what makes henceforth henceforth. Yeah, right. Is there something happened uh -huh. that changed? You changed. You got a new heart. You got a new mind, a new spirit. You're reconciled to God. You had a new co clean conscience. See, you had all of these. Now, from now on, this life is tailored only for this henceforth posture. If you don't follow through with this, you're going to lose what you had. God will not let you keep it. He'll bring the snippers out. Take the branch off. Because salvation is not calculated to be ignored. Yes, amen. Don't walk as other Gentiles, other non-Jews. Some versions say the other, this says other Gentiles. Some just read the Gentiles or the pagans. Some say the rest. In other words, you, 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 you were once, you, you come out of this category, Gentiles which know not God. They're called in 1 Thessalonians 4 or 5. The Gentiles which know not God. You, you came out of that category. Now, people that don't know the Lord, there's a certain way they live. It's not always a debauched life. Sometimes it's a very refined and cultured life, but it's a life without God, without Christ, without regard for heaven, without regard for dying, without regard for the day of judgment. It's fundamentally self-centered. It may be clean. It may be noble. But it's not a life that's lived in view of what's ahead. After the world passes away and after the day of judgment. See, so don't, it says now from henceforth, don't. Don't walk like the Gentiles. Don't live like there isn't a tomorrow. Amen. Well, that there is a tomorrow. Yes. Don't live as though the future is all laid out and guaranteed for you. Make your plans. Just don't live that way. Because you don't know what a day may bring forth. You don't know if there is going to be a tomorrow. So you've got to live on a higher level. Well, he spells it out for them how these other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. So not, we're not talking about an emotion-driven people. <laughs> it doesn't say it because that's, that's a bad case too, people driven by their emotions. That's, but the vanity of their mind, quite a few versions say the futility of their mind one version says the mind is turned to things that bring no profit. That'd be ultimate yeah. profit. Sterile ways of thinking. <laughs> they, don't really, they don't produce anything yeah. that's lasting or of value. Sterile ways of thinking. These are like what if thinkers. What if, what if, what if they're all there's a sterile thinking. Doesn't produce anything. <coughs> A mind set on worthless things, or the Jerusalem Bible says the empty-headed life. <laughs> Their thinking is worthless. The Amplified Bible says their perverseness in the folly, vanity, and emptiness of their souls and the futility of their minds. Well, precisely what does that mean? It's vain, doesn't produce anything. <laughs> pointless and worthless and empty. In this text, it has to do with getting where God is leading you through the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He's told you where the, what, what the goal is. No more children. Grow up into Christ in all things. Every part of the body working and compacting the body together. 
edifying itself in love. He's told you where he's headed. That's where he's headed. Now, whatever kind of preaching, teaching, study isn't leading in that direction, like burn the book. That's where God's told you where he's going now. And any thinking that doesn't produce that is sterile thinking. Now, it may make you millions with a book or something, but it's sterile ways of thinking. Don't walk as a Gentile where your thinking is unproductive in this critical area of growing up into Christ in all things. <coughs> where these results are not being realized, the church has been driven by the vanity of the mind. Is being driven by a futile way of thinking. Doesn't make any difference who the people are, how long they've been there, how nice they seem. If they're not growing up into Christ, something there is fundamentally wrong. Amen. And what it is, is the thinking's bad. The thinking that drives the sermons are bad. Thinking that drives the lessons are bad. Thinking that drives the programs are bad. Is bad thinking, vain thinking, sterile thinking. It's not producing what God's producing. See, until people's minds are in sync with God, they're wasting their time thinking. Because if at the end you don't end up in this category of people that are grown up into Christ, there are no more children to us to and fro, I can tell you the coming of the Lord is going to be a scary proposition. On a personal level, when our thinking does not yield beneficial results, <coughs> have the courage to say it was futile thinking. Mm -hmm. yes, amen. Don't say, oh, I'm going to back up and try it again. I'll come at this another way. Listen, if what you thought would work doesn't work, have the courage to say it was vain, futile thinking. Yes. Amen. Huh? Even some people, they, they can't do that. They're going to keep on plodding along the same way. Yeah. Don't do it. Don't walk as other Gentiles walk. Well, you're going to elaborate on it. That's, that's not quite enough. It's not plain enough. <coughs> He's talking to the church now. To what might be classified as compared to some churches, a pretty good church. Uh -huh. Having the understanding darkened. <coughs> yeah, but your, your mind is like a, like a great room, and if the light's out, you're in the dark. <laughs> some people's mind there's no light there's no light on having the understanding darkened they can't understand because they're in the dark one version says intellectually they're in the dark they can't, they can't really think right they can't draw proper conclusions they can't come up with proper incentives they can't analyze things Spiritually, they can't put it together. They're in the dark. That's the Gentiles. This is, this is their manner. He said, don't you be like this. This is not the kind of people Christ produces. But it's possible they can lapse back into this, <coughs> blinded in their understanding. <coughs> so this depicts a mind that can't understand. Yeah. That's what it is. They can't understand. The Lord Jesus can come down from heaven say it real plain to them, and they still can't understand it. Minds are darkened. <coughs> Jesus said, He that walketh in darkness knoweth not where he goeth. Yeah. So the mind's darkened like you can even tell them what you can even tell them what God's objective is and they can't they can't see it. And they'll just go off another direction anyway. From another point of view, the understanding is darkened by being blind. They'd be looking at it from another. But darkness, God imposed the blind. <coughs> they don't have a capacity to see. They're like Saul of Tarsus. After Jesus appeared to be, he couldn't see. I mean, you could have, you could have, he worked some therapy on him of some kind until Ananias come, he couldn't see. Three days later, he still couldn't see. Didn't have the capacity to see. <coughs> now it says that in John 12, 40, that God blinded their eyes. <laughs> oh, they see, they thought. 
They had a different view of God. They didn't think God is like this. Listen, God can blind your eyes so you cannot understand. Doesn't make any difference how, what your IQ is or who you hear preach or who you hear teach. You can hear the Son of God teach. You can hear the Holy Spirit bearing witness. You can hear an apostle preach or a prophet. And if God blinds your eyes, you're blind as a bat. You can't see it. That's all there is to it. Amen. Now the Gentiles that know not God, that's how they live all the time. He said, don't you, don't you live like that. <coughs> From yet another point of view, the darkness has made him blind. Uh -huh. As is written, that darkness has blinded his eyes, 1 John 2, 11. So see, you walk in, the, you live in the dark and you pretty soon you lose, you can't see. There's a, one of the ministrations that light has, it strengthens sight. Light strengthens sight. Darkness diminishes sight. So if a person chooses to sit like in the darkness, uh -huh. they'll lose their vision. Amen. The darkness will blind their eyes. Well, given, I to give a little testimony. We sent some letters to a <coughs> sister who was having trouble with her eyes. And I was sitting there thinking how the world must have perceived this as being really strange. Yeah. That we sent her letters that she would have to read with her <laughs> yeah, bad eyes. Yeah. And yet after she read these letters, her eyes started to improve. So I was thinking the same thing oh, to yeah, see that man. this this was a this was a ministry. Yeah. That she had to exercise her eyes by reading these good letters. And and even the, her husband said, This is a amazing thing that that I mean that, that, that the Lord would do it this way. Yeah, amen. And I, I was I was very, very pleased with the whole prospect but this is true you know there's certain animals that live in the dark and they're and they're, they're they, they don't want to come to the light no they're used to the dark yeah yeah now there's even another way to look at it the god of this world has blinded their minds see that's yeah. that's that's another way to look at it it's satan in other words <laughs> satan has a certain circumference within which he can work without restriction now, when you're when you're born to Christ, He sets you out outside that circumference. But now, if you fall back into it, Satan's got all the power over you had before, because he has authority to operate in this yes, area which is dominated by ignorance. That's that's one thing this area has has in common is dominated by ignorance, and he can work in that pretty freely. So if you walk not as other Gentiles walk, blinded, don't, don't get in this area where Satan can work. Don't get in it. Yes, you say, I don't know how. Well, learn how. You devote yourself. You better be learned devoting yourself to knowing there's some places you can't walk. Amen. You just can't do it. So that might impinge on my career or what I'm doing. What that, that, you got to work it out. Yes. You've got to come up to the right conclusion. I can't walk as other Gentiles walk mm -hmm. in the dark all the time. I can't, I can't do that. <laughs> you know, you see how serious a matter it is to not be able to see the things of God. The apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, that's what they're doing. Yeah. They're shedding light on the things of God, the things that are in heaven, the Savior, the salvation. That happens to be what they're enlightening. But if you're in an area where the light can't penetrate, you won't benefit from those words. That's not all. They, they, their understanding is darkened. <coughs> I do, whenever you can't understand something pertaining to God, it's always something to be concerned about. Now we're talking about something God said. We're not talking about trying to figure out things God hasn't spoken on. But when something God said remains a mystery to you, you've got to squat on that thing till something happens. Because God made things known to be understood. That's why he made them known. But that's not all. The other Gentiles, alienated from the life of God. Boy, that's a strong word, isn't it? Don't you get it? See, if you couldn't get in that situation, why would he say this? Uh -huh. 
Why would he say walk not as of the Gentiles if there was no danger of, you, of this happening? Yeah. Alienated from the life of God. <laughs> the verses say excluded from the life of God. In other words, stand up, he says separated from the life of God. <laughs> Estranged from the life of God. I don't see how a condition can be worse than this. In other words, there's a God won't let you in this. Yeah. Alienated from the life of God doesn't just mean you're not alive. It, it goes deeper than that. It means you can't get alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're alienated. You're God's enemy. You're not yeah. his friend. There's a, there's a condition like this, yeah. in other words. There's a condition like this. Now, all of us were once in this state. Uh -huh. Understand, we all were once in this state. But we were delivered out of this state. Woe to the person who lapses back into it. Amen. Alienated from the life of God. <coughs> They're foreigners to it, in other words. When you get to the life of God, which has to do with him, himself, his purpose, his will, what he's doing, and all this sort of thing, and you can't, you can't see it. Because you're alienated. Yeah. You're a stranger, in other words. You're a stranger. Yeah. There's some people, when they traffic in the Word of God, they're in strange territory. Mm -hmm. They're alienated from the life of God. And Jesus proved this is the case. Jesus walked among men. There could, couldn't have possibly been a greater light than him. There couldn't possibly have been more potent words and words he spoke, and they yeah. just fell off some people like water off a duck's back. Yeah, right. Why? They were alienated from the life of God. Maybe there's people you've been trying to reason with, and you can't, you can't get through. And you've used, you think you've, you've appealed to the Word of God, you've prayed about it, you're very careful, you're not, you're taking precautions not to say speech that's not seasoned with salt and so forth, and you just can't get through. Alienated yeah. from the life of God. Now you see, the general Jewish population didn't know the truth about the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the lawyers. They couldn't see, but when the light came, uh -huh. oh, these people were, were a generation of snakes, that's what he called them. The Mulele brethren found one snake, huh? and they knew they had to get rid of it. We're in a generation got snakes all over the place. A generation of vipers, plural. But if the light's not on, you just get bit, that's all. Alienated from the life of God, he tells you what alienated him. Through the ignorance. So what happened? We once were enemies, now we're reconciled to God. We once were alienated, now we're, now we're been reconciled to God. But if ignorance prevails, or to state it another way, you don't grow up, your ignorance alienates you from God. Amen. What's that mean? It means God won't walk with people he's not agreed with. That's right. I just, what he said in Amos, how can two walk together except they be agreed? You expect God to walk with you and you don't agree with him? Well, of course, this is absurd. This is what alienated us in the first place. This is why we got in trouble in the first place. Alienated to the ignorance that is in them. See, this is an argument for growing up. I don't, <laughs> don't miss that. It's an argument for growing up. Paul several times said, I would not have you to be ignorant. Peter said, be not ignorant of this one thing. He, no, there's, there's some things you can't afford not to know. Then he, he makes one more, gives one more trait. The blindness, because of the blindness of their heart. Most of the versions read hardness of the heart. <coughs> Both of them are correct translations, I, that's what I understand. They're from different perspectives. If the heart is perceived as being, is seen as being perceptive, the eyes of the heart, then blindness of heart. If the heart is seen as this area of sensitivity, 
hardness of heart. See, it's, what it is, it's talking about the same thing. The idea that it can't be, can't be penetrated. The light can't get into it. The divine influence can't get into it. It's like a, the only way to deal with this, that heart of stone has got to be taken out. You can't convert a stony heart. <coughs> got to take it out. But to take it out, you got to have some understanding. You have to get close enough to God to understand what he's saying, at least enough to flee to him for refuge. You've got to at least know that much. <coughs> so the word here refers to covering over the means of seeing. In other words, it's, if it's a hard, it'd be like a callous hard, like a hard callous of unbelief grew over it and heart was blind. The means of seeing or understanding has been rendered ineffective. Now this is why some some people remain in a unacceptable state. It's it's not our business to determine who these people are and understand. That's that's not our business. But our business is to make sure we're not one of them. That's our business. Make sure your business makes sure you're not one of these people. And let me make, make, make this quite clear. You will be one of these people if you don't grow up. Yes. Right. Uh, yes. Circumstances where we may have to, where we may have to determine something along these lines about someone we're dealing with. Yeah. Paul did. <coughs> I'm in the sense Jesus. of being total rejection. You yeah. Know? Gener generally speaking, I understand. <coughs> yes, are, I understand what you're saying. There are conditions and circumstances where we have to decide this. This person is is ignorant and refuses yeah. to acknowledge God's truth, and and uh, we turn if they'll be able to, to recover or not. Yeah, we turn them over to God. It, yeah, if we shake the dust off our feet and turn them over to God. Yeah, but I understand we don't have the capacity that the master yeah. did to read their hearts. Yeah, they may be like Manasseh, and that that's that's God's doing. But it's we can't make a final determination on people. As you said, you can't keep on trying to shine light into hard hearts. You just, it's got to stop. Jesus did it. He left those areas. The apostles did it. They left those areas. He told his the 70 and he told the 12 when he sent them out. He said, if you're not welcome, dust your feet off and move on. We're not able to do anything about the circumstance of the That's person right. at that point. That's right. Someone else may be able to. That's right. Or at another time, but we can't. That's right. <laughs> Which actually proves the effectiveness of the gospel. They went and they preached, but if it wasn't received, well, then there was something to do about that, too. That's right. Yes. Reveal their hearts. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> now, if you wanted to put it down in simplistic terms... Every person and the church as a whole has got to remain in the point where they can receive what God says without a bunch of question marks. And that they can are advancing in their comprehension. Again, I'm defining comprehension as being able to draw a valid conclusion. If you can't draw a valid conclusion, you don't understand the equation. But the equation is given to be understood. So you can uh, you can ask the Lord, give me understanding on on this. Help me help me to see this. <coughs> yes. Considering um, his exhortation here, and he says, "Don't walk in this way." Yeah. And I thought, well, how how would one be turned to walk in this way in the, in the very beginning? And I was um, remembering the mind that he spoke about and the eyes and. These things are like resources that are given to mankind by God mm -hmm. to be able to uh, receive the things that he has for them and then traffic in the area that he wants them to be. So in, uh, in having those resources and squandering them, that mm. would be the beginning of beginning right. to walk in this That's way right. because yeah. we're spending the resources That's God right. gave us for something other than yeah. his intended purpose for that. Mm -hmm. And so then this hardness comes about and the blindness and mm. the Lord doesn't give anything else out there. Amen. Yeah. Well said. <coughs> I he con continues talking about this condition that we're not to walk is this condition. These are the people that was blindness of heart and alienated from God and the hardness of heart and so forth. Who being past feeling, 
<coughs> now as you see in the in the ordained process, if I may call it that, there's there's equipping the saints, edifying, building up ministry, compacted together by everything that each joint supplies, growing up into Christ. See, it's the process, growing up into Christ, speaking the truth in love, edifying itself in love. See, it's a... Now, the other is a process, too. That's right. Except it's downward. It's a downward process. <coughs> First, there's a... Hardening of the heart and the ears not hearing and eyes not seeing, walking in the darkness. Then the heart gets harder, more ineffective. And then pretty soon it, it doesn't feel at all. Past feeling. <coughs> Think of it this way. First the understanding is darkened. Then alienation. Begins to set in place. <coughs> then your past feeling, then you're given over. To, yeah, that's right. That's the process. Now, you don't have control of the process upward or the process downward. Yes. Amen. You can't accelerate or nullify the process upward. Your point is to stay in, stay yeah. in the process yeah. upward. That concludes by the whole body ministering to one another in love. Stay, there's this other process, and once you start this, mm -hmm. you got to be delivered from it. You, yeah. you can't climb out of this. Yeah, that's right. You've got to be delivered from it. And there aren't any specified number of times how many he'll deliver you. Yes. He gave Israel seven times, right? They t tempted him seven times. Past feeling. Others say you become callous. The NIV says you lost all sensitivity. <coughs> or no longer have any sense of shame. That's, that's, that's pretty good. Or a sense of right and wrong is once it's dulled. Or being past repentance. That's our Tyndale, see? There's this stage where you become irrecoverable. He's not saying you're in this. He's saying don't get in this. Don't walk as other Gentiles walk. Past feeling. <laughs> this state equates with seared conscience. It's the same, yeah. same kind of thing. Or it's being turned over to a reprobate mind. Yeah. This reminds me of Paul's words. Down That's Romans right. Four. Yeah. Except maybe the, the, the circle. The description in Romans was right. more Amen. extensive. Amen. That's it. They had the Gentile status. That's exactly right. <coughs> there, in the in the, it's the same process mentioned in Hebrews six, there the process was not going on to perfection, and what happened was that they be retrogressed to where it was not possible to renew them again to repentance if they continued in that state. So failing to leave spiritual childhood and grow up into Christ, this is the kind of results you're going to get. Amen. You can't avoid this. Eventually this will happen. Yeah. If the person does not break out of childhood, this is what's going to happen. And God has told us about it. And no one will, that, that sincerely wants to avoid this condition, I don't believe that such a person will fall into it. Uh -huh. Their, their faith and their persuasion will keep God on their side. <coughs> they will not probably be satisfied with their progress themselves, but if they remain, if they don't lose their sensitivity and they remain in the upward motion, God will bring them out yes, of these things. Remember Paul's argument for growing up and the whole congregation coming to a new man. That's his argument. Everybody growing up and the whole congregation being a new man. The perfect man, as the scripture says, the perfect man. <coughs> Salvation is calculated to produce grown men. Yes, amen. That's what it's calculated to do. It's not that that's just an ideal. 
be nice if you can grow up and mature. That's what it's calculated to do. From Satan's point of view, what this downward pull is, is Satan trying to keep you childish. He'd just prefer just to pull you down in the bottomless pit down there, but he can't do that with some, some people won't go that far intentionally. So he'll just get them out of the loop. And being there long enough, they will go to the bottom of the pit. <laughs> From heaven's point of view, these efforts of fossils, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are the means by which the child of God grows. You've got an intercessor in heaven, you've got an intercessor within. You've been given all things pertaining to life and godliness and given all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. See, every advantage is supplied and Jesus is your captain. He's the captain of your salvation. So everything is designed to cause this to happen. But if they get past feeling, give themselves over to lasciviousness. Some versions read lewdness. Every kind of impurity, evil passion, sensuality, promiscuous, licentiousness, so forth. Well, to break, get down to the bottom line. It's where sin boils out into conduct. It's not thinking anymore. We're not talking about lustful thoughts. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the fulfilling of lustful thoughts. We're not talking about hatred in your heart just staying. We're talking about the expression of it. Yeah. See? That's lascivious. It's a it's a it's a inner it's a determination. I'm gonna do what I want, even if it's bad, I'm gonna do it, and I'm gonna do it as much as I can. Yeah. Hmm? Now, I've known people that fell into this. <laughs> Maybe you do too. Here's a circumstance that's the opposite of reigning in life. See, in Christ Jesus, you reign in life. Yeah. This is the exact opposite. You are reigned over by sin. Just dominates you and takes a hold of you. <laughs> they work all uncleanness with greediness. This accounts for drunkards, drug addicts, whoremongers, sodomites, serial killers, People can't help but steal all of that. See, that's, that's what happened. Yeah. They're working it with all greediness. They can't get out of this sinful loop. Yeah, that's right. But a lot preceded them getting there. Uh -huh. yeah. They didn't fall in there overnight. Oh, no. No, their hearts grew calloused and their understanding wasn't productive and they became insensitive and finally dropped off into this. <laughs> now he's why does he say this again he says this because if you don't grow up into Christ this is what's at the other end yes, amen. and Jesus has it Jesus isn't going to hold your hand and walk with you like a baby all the time yeah. he's not going to do this we understand he does it at first and he does it during very difficult times He'll carry those that are lame. I mean, he, and with young, he does this. But this, like, isn't the standard. Yeah, yeah. This is his mercy it allows him to do this. But the aim is that we get these sheep strong. Yes, amen. If he carries a sheep, it's not that this is the sheep I'm going to carry from now on. He carries it and tends to it so it won't have to be carried. Yes, He'll be able to walk right. on its own. Now this text that we read <coughs> is not a commentary on the condition of the Ephesian church. It was a warning not to get in mm -hmm. yeah. to this category that these all spiritual blessings in heavenly places and being seated with Christ in heavenly places and being raised up to sit with Christ and receiving this abundance of grace. This has not been just to get us out uh -huh. of sin and guilt. It has been to get us in. Yes. 
where there isn't any of this. And the way you get prepared for it is instead of walking in darkness, you walk in the light. Instead of your heart being insensitive and hard, you keep it tender, malleable. So it's easy to cry when you sin. And so you can't ignore it when, you, when you're out of the way or not measuring up. When you see somebody else that you can sense is further, further along and you, you want to eagerly be like that, it provokes you to an effort yes. Amen. to be like that. So if, you mail, if a person fails to move forward and comprehend with all saints the height, the length, and depth, and width, and so forth, he'll go backward and become blind. Yeah. Now listen, brethren, if, <coughs> if God didn't care for us, he'd have never told us this. Yeah. Uh -huh. the, fact, the fact that this and other warnings similar to it is in the scripture is confirmation that God is serious Amen. now about saving his people. He, he, this is serious. God is serious with this. He has not beguiled anybody by saying it. He has mercy with the Lord. This is the truth. But there's, we're in a situation where there's an adversary without and within. And so he warns us of this, lest we be deceived. And children are deceived real easy. A little harder to deceive those who are grown up. Yeah. Considering the wisdom that Paul had in giving this thorough warning, mm -hmm. he takes it step by step and follows it to the end of the yeah. process. Yeah. And that can deal um, a very quick sobriety. Amen. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was thinking back in the Pilgrim's Progress book about the time when the sojourners were drawn off the path and they were deceived into thinking that it was parallel to the way. Mm -hmm. but they didn't know the end of where it was going to take them. Mm -hmm. And when they came back to the path, they put a sign at that place in the yes, road amen. to tell the other <laughs> sojourners of where that path was going to end up. Amen. Yes. a thorough warning. This is what Paul is doing. Uh -huh. That's right. The yeah. end of the path. Amen. Mm -hmm. amen. Amen. Very good word. Yes. Yes, we'll turn. You used the word current in the very beginning. <laughs> and it, uh, it occurred to me that... now. Uh, it's like a the wickedness in the world. It's like a, a briskly flowing current, like a creek or something. And you, and you're constantly, with, in this viewpoint, we're we're left in the creek, and we're and but you have to swim. You have to constantly be swimming yeah. against the current. It's if you a, if you don't, then boy, you're going to be swept. The idea the is that you'll be swept away by the current. So that's right. There's never a time when you can't be swimming. So to, or moving against the current, you know, you'll just yeah. sweep you right away. Amen. 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 Yeah. Yes. Just um, seems to me like you, if you, the scripture says, if you see a brother sin or sin not unto death, you ask. I, I I know there's been times in my life when I didn't see it clearly, but somebody, somebody asked did, for yes. me. Somebody yeah. asked, mm -hmm. and God gave me grace because mm -hmm. they asked. That's right. And so this is quite a ministry the body has. Of edifying itself in, in love is, is being able to have the wisdom and the insight to see what, what the other brother needs and, mm -hmm. and minister grace mm -hmm. and, and minister in such a way that they, they can receive it. Not that they'll stay there, but they can grow up together. Mm -hmm. And this is, um, I know I can testify for myself. I didn't even know what was wrong. I traveled for so many years and I didn't, I, I had a good heart. I think I wanted to know the truth, but I, I was kept from this. Well, we talked about tonight to a greater extent because I deprived myself from the body. Amen. This is what happened. And mm -hmm. I, I can see it now, but I couldn't see it then. Yeah, but somebody, I'm convinced somebody saw oh, it did. and lifted it up. <laughs> and so the, I was given grace amen, to see it. Amen. 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 From a teacher's point of view, I appreciate I think I've seen this before, but you put it together so well this evening, this mm -hmm. contrasting perspective yeah. of the body, of the process of the body growing and maturing. Yeah. And then if it doesn't, you got oh, another no. That's you're right. going to fall off. There's a precipice here that you'll right. fall off. Mm -hmm. Back, back yeah. to where you were before. Yeah, neither conversion nor reprobacy happens like in the twinkling of an eye. Yeah. 
Even Saul of Tarsus, after Jesus appeared to him, he didn't get any really instruction until three days, yeah, <laughs> three right. days later. And that was only the beginning. That's right. That was just the beginning have, of it. We have occasions where he learned more later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, amen. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember. Oh, yes. It's been probably 10, 15 years ago. Uh, James Dobson did an interview with someone who was on death row. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah. He, he was a serial really, killer. Uh, explained it was exactly how you did it. As you look back on his yeah. life, how he really had godly parents that tried to teach him, and he just ignored it through it all. He yeah. persisted on doing well, and it went from one level down to another level. Yeah, to mm -hmm. Ted Bundy, I remember that. I remember that incident, yes. Yeah. And he was warning them now that he knows his life is anything. Finally, he no. couldn't get out. He couldn't get out of it. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, he was enslaved, enslaved to it. That's he gave right. warnings to people to yeah. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. <laughs> Lord, dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the great salvation you've given us, and for the glorious effects that it has upon the human heart. We pray that you'd give us grace to continue to be strong in faith to stay in this circumference of divine activity. We thank thee for it, for defining things for us so we can draw proper conclusions. And help us all to conclude that we'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. In Jesus' name, amen.